Okay, ooh, so my phone goes off. Hello, hola muchachos, and welcome to part three of Heroes. I'm sounding a bit uh, 1980s DJ there, wasn't I? Sorry about that. Anyway, I don't know why I'm talking to the microphone rather than the camera as well. Okay, Heroes, let's get cracking. Sorry, like I said, I was late. I lost track of time because I was watching German football from four months ago. What a glorious opportunity this is <laughs> to, to waste time. Oh, dear. Right, all. So, just open the book up. So remember, yesterday we're continuing to get these clues about um, <coughs> Francis. Forgot, forget the name, main character's name. That's great. Um, <coughs> that he's a man with no face. Something terrible has happened to him. That he's deliberately keeping himself secret. That so he has this mission, and the mission, of course, is to uh, well, he says to kill Larry LaSalle, whoever that is. He has an obsession with Nicole Renard. And so far, he's successfully hiding his identity. Hello, Jamie. Good to see you. Um, remember, as I always say, I'm better now at looking at the messages as we go along, but I'll try to answer throughout, or if not, um, I'll look to uh, respond to stuff at the end. And uh, also, have a look at yesterday's stream and look at the comments because Sophie put some brilliant comments up. Remember, I was trying to make that that link uh, between uh, Canada, that comment about Canada being a sort of heavenly, sort of perfect place. Uh, so, have a look at that. Right, sorry, I'm, I'm just allowing myself to get distracted by messages coming in for me, so I'm just going to turn the sound off on everything, everything I've got. Hello, Alfie. Hiya, mate. And um, you'll get cracking. There. Shouldn't get disturbed now. Sorry about that. Very unprofessional that was, not that of me. Okay, so. So we're starting off basically with uh, Francis <coughs> describing what it's like when he goes to bed at night. And this bit coming up now, remember I said about this being a, an anti war book? Well, here's some really useful sections of that. The tenement is heated only by the black stove in the kitchen, fed by a glass oil jug that I'll have to fill every day or two from the big metal barrel in the backyard. The stove throws heat only in a small area of the kitchen, and the rest of the tenement is damp with cold, even though winter has gone. I make myself a cup of cocoa, stalling, delaying the moment of going to bed, despite the cold. The clock on the wall, in the shape of a banjo, tells me it's 25 minutes after 11, which means that a long night stretches ahead. I yearn for sleep, my eyes raw and burning, and I know that the dreams will begin when I close my eyes and drift off. In the bathroom, I apply more Vaseline to my cheeks. Finally, I slip into bed, Mrs. Belandez provided me with extra blankets and I pull them up to my chin. I double the pillow under my head to prevent the phlegm from running down my throat, causing me to choke and cough. This is not the main bit I'm talking about with the horrors of war, but just um, the word mundane, meaning sort of every day, sort of not dramatic, um, the mundane problems that he has, so apart from the obvious massive problems of the, the devastation of his face, he has these little irritating things which, which matter in your day-to-day -day life. Um, he can't sleep at night. His phlegm will make him choke. He has to, he has to have extra um, pillows under his head to stop himself from, from choking and coughing all through the night. Uh, oh. But here is... So that's a sort of indirect point about the, the, the effect of war, but now here is a more direct one. I can never trace the moment when I finally fall asleep, that blurred line between wakefulness and oblivion. While waiting, I silently recite the names of the guys in my platoon, Richards and Eisenberg and Chambers and, yes, Smith, and their first names or nicknames, Eddie and Irwin and Blinky and Jack. Then, more last names, Johnson and Orlandi and Riley and O'Brien, and their first names, Henry and Sonny and Spooks and Billy, and then start over again, arrange them this time in alphabetical order, still waiting for sleep to come. I don't want to think about them. 
<coughs> oh, sorry, those three eyes in my platoon. I don't want to recite their names. I want to forget what happened there in France, but every night the recitation begins like a litany. The names of the GIs like beads on a rosary. I close my eyes and see them advancing in scattered groups through the abandoned village, ruined homes and debris-clattered streets. Our rifles ready, late afternoon shadows obscuring the windows and doorways and the alley entrances. We're all tense and nervous and scared because the last village seemed peaceful and vacant until sudden gunfire from snipers erupted from those windows and doorways and cut down the advance patrol just ahead of our platoon. Now I can hear Henry Johnson's ragged breathing and blinky chambers whistling between his teeth, the village too still, too quiet. Jesus, Sonny Orlandi mutters. Jesus, meaning I'm scared, and so is everybody else. Clenched fists holding firearms, quiet curses floating on the air, grunts and hisses and farts, not like the war movies at the Plymouth, nobody displaying heroics or bravado. We're probably taking the final steps of our lives in this village, whose name we don't even know, and other villages are waiting ahead of us, and Eddie Richards asks of nobody in particular, what the hell are we doing here anyway? And he's clutching his stomach because he's had diarrhoea for three days, carrying the stink with him all that time, so that everybody has been avoiding his presence. Now gunfire erupts, and at the same time, artillery shells, theirs or ours, boom in the air and explode around us. We run for cover, scrambling and scurrying, hitting the dirt, trying to become part of the buildings themselves, but not safe anywhere. I find myself in a narrow alley, groping through rising dust. And two German soldiers in white uniforms appear like grim ghosts. Rifles coming up, but my automatic is too quick, and the head of one of the soldiers explodes like a ripe tomato, and the other cries mama as my gunfire cuts him in half, both halves of him tumbling to the ground. I explode into wakefulness, along with the booming artillery, and I find myself gasping, instantly wide-eyed, not cold for once in Mrs. Berlander's tenement, the sweat warm on my flesh, but in a minute the sweat turns icy. In the alley that day I encountered the German soldiers all right, but my burst of gunfire killed the soldiers quickly. No exploding head. No body cut in two, although one of them did cry mama as he fell. When I looked down at them, in one of those eerie pauses that happens in an attack, a sudden silence that's even more terrible than exploding shells, I saw how young they were. Boys of apple cheeks, too young to shave, like me. Hey Francis, come on, yells Eddie Richards, and I join him in a scramble out the alley and into the woods, his smell still heavy in the air, and we stumble around in the woods until night time, when we run across the remains uh, yeah, sorry, we run across the remains of our platoon and learn that Jack Smith and Billy O'Brien are dead, and had Henry Johnson wounded, his chest ripped open by shrapnel, carried off somewhere behind the lines, and we never see him again. The next day, the grenade blows my face away. Like I said, the horrors of war is, is a, a major theme in this book. Well, that's horrific. And uh, he pulls no punches in the way that he makes it sound horrific. Um, and as well, of course, this idea of what is a hero. So, he said, the Plymouth is a local cinema. And they'll be showing these sort of war movies where the, the soldiers are heroes. And he's saying it's not heroic. It's not like that. It's like this. It's people who are absolutely terrified, who are about to die any moment, and to die in some village they've never heard of. Um, one of them's fouled his pants, he's got diarrhea, so he's got to walk around with all that in his pants because they're on the move, that's that. And it stinks, and they're frightened. And then he, he lists his friends at the start of that section, and by the end he's saying, you know, two of them are dead, and the other one obviously will become dead, and that language of ripping his chest opened up. So really horrific. So they're not like heroes, they're just frightened lads, and their the war is not glamorous, like it looks like in the movies. Again, this idea of heroes running into battle. War is terror. Him killing the German soldiers as well. So remember, he said yesterday, I hadn't killed anybody yet. Well, there you go, he's killed two German soldiers. 
and again bringing home that idea of the horror of war. Firstly, when he imagines it in his nightmare, it's much more graphic and spectacular. So it's horrible to read one of them, their head exploding, the other one cut in half. That's not actually what happened, but he did kill those soldiers. Um, and then him saying they look so young. They look like, you know, just like me. They're just kids. They also, I guess you'd call it PD, PTSD now, wouldn't you? When he goes to sleep, he has the horrible nightmares that he wakes up screaming from because of the psychological effect of the war. So there's all those things to, <laughs> to factor in. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's a very strong evocation of how horrific war is and how heroism is something different from what we expect. Oh, and we also learned that last line, this little throwaway last lines again. The next day, the grenade blows my face away. So, you know, well, I'm sure we sort of suspect it's something like that, but there's a bit more detail. A grenade is what's made him like this, and the war. Um, you might want to notice, say this came up in an extract question. Such long sentences. And the idea of that is to, to make it feel like lots of people are happening. To make you feel like lots of things are happening all at the same time, quickly and quickly and quickly. So it's difficult to keep up. Which, if you think about it, is how you would surely feel in that situation. It's not an organised sort of uh, military manoeuvre. It's suddenly someone shot at you and you're running for cover and everything's happening all around you and you're terrified. So it, it, the style of writing tries to reflect that state of mind. So if you've got an extra question, that'd be quite a good thing to point out if it was on that bit. If it wasn't on that bit, don't point it out because it's not in the bit. The, no, you know what I mean. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry. The morning sun slashes my eyelids and I blink at daylight, spilling through the window. I survived another night, endured the dreams and the memories again, although I'm not sure anymore which are the dreams and which are the memories. My limbs are stiff and the raw places of my flesh sting, but I grope from the bed, coughing, my throat filled with phlegm. Again, not heroic, is it? Remember, he's a silver star hero, although he said he's disgusted by being called a hero. This is not a heroic image, is it? Ignore it all, I tell myself, and count your blessings. You're back in Frenchtown, and your body is functioning. You have a nice dry place to stay, and a mission to perform. Maybe this will be the day that Larry LaSalle will appear on the streets of Frenchtown, and you'll be able to carry out that mission. I tell myself that I will not visit the rec centre. Rec, spelled like a wrecked thing, W-R-E-C-K. That there's nothing to gain from going there, just as the visit in the Coles house on 6th Street brought back only loneliness and regret. Even as I acknowledge the futility of such visits, I'm walking in the direction of the rec centre at the far end of 3rd Street, bending against the never-ending March wind. Then a hand grips my shoulder, stopping me in my tracks, and a voice whispers in my ear, Landmine? Turning, raising my eyes under the visor of the Red Sox cap, I find Arthur Riviere looking at me curiously. The curiosity is softened with sympathy. I shake my hand, not deserving his sympathy. Again, this thing, how he's negative about himself. Grenade, then, he asks. My silence provides him with the answer, and he murmurs, Tough, tough. His eyes are bleary and bloodshot, and there's no recognition of me in them for which I am grateful. Before he enlisted in the army, Arthur Riviere had been a star first baseman for the French Town Tigers and hit booming home runs over the fence at Carrier's Field. I remember when he returned on furlough in his khaki uniform with the corporal's stripes along with the other servicemen home temporarily from the war. I wanted to be like them, these heroes fighting the Japs and the Germans, going off to battles on land and sea. I was impatient to reach the age when I could join them in that great crusade for freedom. Again, the image of the hero is not, as you saw a moment ago, linked to the reality. Arthur Riviere points to the entrance to the St Jude Club and says, Come on, I'll buy you a drink. The club is where the young men of Frenchtown gather to shoot pool and play poker and drink beer and wine and hold Saturday night dances with their girlfriends after a long week in the comb and button shops. The rules require a member to be 21 years old before joining, and every Frenchtown boy looks forward to that birthday. At my hesitation, Arthur says, you deserve a good drink. Remember, he's only 18, isn't he? 
Inside the club is crowded and smoke-filled, billiard balls clicking and everyone talking at once, and a sudden blast of music from the jukebox. Don't sit under the apple tree with anyone else but me, which I last heard on the radio in the English hospital. Familiar faces turn toward me. Big Boy Bergeron and Armand Tellier and Joe Lafontaine and some others, all of them veterans and survivors, ball players and shop workers who, become, who became fighting men in uniform. Beer, I answer, raised my voice but then when Arthur asked me what I want to drink. I drank beer for the first time in the English hospital when Enrico bribed a male nurse on a late shift to bring us a few bottles. The beer was warm and bitter, but at least a change from all the medicine I had to swallow every day. I gulp the beer now, lifting the scarf, as Arthur enters into a conversation with Big Boy Bergeron about whether he, it would be better to become cops or firemen now that the war is over. Big Boy, who weighed about £300 before entering the service and is now sleek and hard with no soft edges, says firemen offer the best career because you don't have to march or walk as a fireman. With my luck as a cop, I'd end up walking a beat. And I'm not walking anymore. The infantry spoiled my feet. I could never climb a ladder, says Armand Tellier, speaking to nobody in particular, as he lines up a shot at the pool table. Besides, I say cops will be riding in cars on patrol from now on. Walking or riding, no more piecework at the shop for me. College for me, Joe LaFontaine announces, holding up his beer and sudden the way light strikes the glass. The GI Bill. The government's willing to pay, so I'm going. He didn't even graduate from high school, Arthur Riviere says, but in a joking way, laughing. Others join in the laughter, creating a camaraderie in a bar, a fellowship that I wish I could be a part of. I can make up the studies, Joe LaFontaine replies. They're going all out for veterans. He takes a swift gulp of the beer. I'm going to college, he proclaims, raising his voice so everyone can hear. I'm going to be a teacher. Sister Martha must be turning over in her grave, Armand Tellier says. That'll be a trick, Arthur says. I saw her just last week, still knocking guys around in the eighth grade. No bigger than the penis, and she still knocks them around. The way she knocked you, big boy laughs, and everyone joins in the laughter, and someone calls for another round, and the jukebox plays, I'll be with you in apple blossom time. Such sweet voices in the air. Arthur turns to me. You don't talk much, do you? He says. I want to ask about Larry LaSalle. If anyone knows when and if he's coming back. But I don't want to call more attention to myself. The scarf and bandage were enough to cause curiosity. That's all right, he says. You earned the right not to talk. What if I told him that I was little Francis Cassavant, who <laughs> fetched balls behind the bases when the French town Tigers played their cross town rivals, the West Side Knights, for the Monument Championship? <clears throat> that I am not the hero he thinks I am. Not like the other veterans here in the St. Jude Club. As the big argument resumes about cops and firemen, I slip out the bar and notice into the March dampness of 3rd Street. I make my way through the throng of shoppers and the school kids leaving St. Jude School. My identity protected by the scarf and the bandage. My head is light from the beer because I haven't eaten since my breakfast but I force myself to drink the coffee and eat the oatmeal. I am on my way, of course, to the rec centre. As you can hear, my throat's failing. <coughs> and I got myself a glass of water. And I think I've left it downstairs. So can you just pardon me for one sec while I run and fetch it? Um, I have a little think while I'm gone about that thing he said. I am not the hero he thinks I am, but like the other veterans here in the St. Jude Club. Little think. Be back in ten seconds. Uh, maybe, maybe 15. Hey, I'm back. Sorry, chaps. With my pint of water. There's a lovely leaving gift years ago from a pupil. It's got engraved onto it. Mark Griffiths, Rex FC's number one commentator. And you can take that to the bank, guys. That's fact. 
Well, I think I remember correctly when he gave me this, I was the only commentator. <laughs> Mm. Ah, thank you. That's better. So that comment about um, not being the hero he thinks I am. Again, he's negative about himself, isn't he? Again, this no, this sort of perception of how things should be, the camaraderie in the bar feels like how it ought to be. But these are broken people, aren't they? I mean, Arthur Riviere with his eyes bloodshot. You know, this used to be the heroic baseball player he looked up to and now he well sounds like he's struggling a bit but going to the bar maybe keeps him going and they're all talking about how they can rebuild their lives and make up for the fact that the war has interrupted their lives okay now then the rec center has been mentioned already this technique he's got he mentions things and leaves it just leaves you wondering and then picks it up again well now we're going to get it and it's a hmm it's a crucial venue in this book. And it's got quite an exaggerated story to hear in a moment. Just before I do answer that, huh? Thank you. Um, the... You've now met Arthur Riviere. You would not get a question about him. There are only three characters they could really answer questions about in the exam. And that is... Francis, Nicole, and Larry. Those are the three characters you, you learn enough about. Um, you could, though, easily get a question about war, or the effects of war, or the horrors of war, how this is an anti-war book, or just a general question about the nature of what is a hero. And Arthur would definitely be useful in those sorts of questions. So you wouldn't have to know about Arthur in enough detail to answer a full essay question on him. But I think it would be useful to know about him in enough detail uh, to what he symbolises, if you like. So if you get a question about the war, you could talk about him and the, you know, the fact that you'll see a little bit more of this, that he's been affected by the war. Um, there's, a, there's a particular very short section that really illustrates that well later on. So Arthur's someone to bear in mind could be useful for you, but he won't be a full essay question on his own. There's not enough on him in this book to... To justify that. Okay, one more sip of water and then rec centre. <clears throat> the rec centre is boarded up and abandoned now. The words French town rec centre faded and barely visible above the front door. Can I just point out rec centre? R E C. It's short for recreation. So it's like a sort of youth club or something like that. But when I mentioned before, it was spelled W-R-E-C-K, like a destroyed thing, a wreck. So, you know, have a little think about that, because we're going to have it explained in a moment. The door's red paint has turned to faint, sickly pink. My caves begin to run, and my scarf is damp. And after a moment, I realise that it's not the moisture from my caves that has dampened my scarf. It's a bad luck place, people had said. A place of doom, others added. In the old days, it had been known as Grenier's Hall, and the children of Frenchtown, myself among them, often heard its tragic story. Not a tragic story at the beginning, however. The hall had been a place of happy events, gala dances and fancy balls to mark occasions like New Year's Eve and the 4th of July. It became a traditional place for wedding receptions, the bridal party marching the length of 3rd Street to the hall after the wedding mass at St Jude's. Until the wedding of Marie Blanche Turin. Marie Blanche married a handsome Irisher by the name of Dennis O'Brien from the Plains of North Monument after breaking off her engagement to Hervey Rochelle, the shipping room foreman at the Monument Comb Shop. At the reception, during a pause between the dinner and the dancing, as Marie Blanche and Dennis cut the wedding cake, Hervey burst into the hall, a gun blazing in his hands. A moment later, Marie Blanche lay bloody and dying in her wedding gown. A bullet entered Dennis O'Brien's spine, leaving him paralysed for the rest of his life. Hervey hung himself that evening in a tool shed behind the comb shop. That was the end of Grenier's Hall as a festive gathering place. The doors were sealed and the windows shuttered. Children shivered as they'd listened to the story of that day of doom and always hurried by the abandoned building. Some claimed that on windy nights when the moon was full, the sounds of moaning and weeping could be heard if you pressed your ear against the front door. 
It became a French town tradition for children to listen at the door at midnight on the night of a full moon as a rite of passage. Before my turn arrived, however, Grenier's Hall was given a reprieve and began a new existence. I was in the seventh grade, the year that Nicole Renard came into my life, when the hall's transformation began. People rushed to the site on Saturday morning as word spread through the streets that carpenters and painters were attacking the building in a frenzy of activity. I rushed to the scene and watched in amazement as trucks and vans emblazoned with the words City of Monument disgorged teams of workmen who we learned had been hired under a new municipal programme. In the next few days, the men worked frantically, scraping and painting, replacing doors and windows, tarring the roof. But the work was haphazard. Workers dropped hammers, spilled paint, stumbled over each other, and occasionally pulled brown paper bags from their pockets and took quick gulps from hidden bottles. It's like watching a Marx Brothers movie, said Eugene Rouleau, a barber whose tongue was as sharp as his razor. When the workers finally completed the job, the building still looked unfinished. The white paint didn't completely cover the dark patches of mildew on the clapboards and the shutters sagged next to the windows. Look, someone called. As we watched, the sign that read Frenchtown Rec Centre slid from its place above the front entrance until it hung at a drunken angle above the door. It's still a bad luck place, Albert Laurier of Laurier's drugstore said. People nodded in agreement, remembering the wedding reception of Marie Blanche de Turin. At night, someone crossed out the words on the sign and replaced them with Rec Centre in bright red paint, REC, W-R-E-C-K, as so you see, it's a pun where a word has more than one meaning, or the sa two words sound the same and you can make a joke out of it, so it's not the REC Centre, R-E-C, Recreation Centre, it's the REC Centre, W-R-E-C-K, it's a REC. Although the sign was restored to its original wording, the place was known ever after as the REC Centre with the W to the people of Frenchtown. The centre opened its doors the day after St Jude's parochial school closed for summer vacation. I stood with the other kids at nine o'clock on that June morning in front of the building. A tall, slim man stepped into view, a lock of blonde hair tumbling over his forehead, his smile revealing dazzling movie star teeth. Good morning, he said. My name is Larry LaSalle. Oh, Larry LaSalle, this is Larry LaSalle. Larry LaSalle, the man is, we now know he wants to kill in the future. This sounds like Terminator. Is that his real name? Joey LeBlanc asked in a whisker, the cat whisker, a whisper that carried over the crowd. He was often punished by the nuns for talking out of tune. That's right, it's real, Larry LaSalle said. And for some reason, the crowd applauded. Larry LaSalle had the broad shoulders of an athlete and the narrow hips of a dancer. He was both. He swung the bat with authority as he hit home runs in games at the Sandlot next door and later led us through vigorous exercises and calisthenics. He was also a dancer with a touch of Fred Astaire in his walk, his feet barely touching the floor. He could tap dance with machine gun speed and make daring leaps across the stage. But he was most of all a teacher, leading classes in dancing, arts and crafts, organising a choral group, directing musical shows. The rec centre became my headquarters in the 7th and 8th grades, a place away from the sidewalks and empty lots of Frenchtown. I'd never been a hero in such places, too short and uncoordinated for baseball, too timid to join the gangs or hung around the street corners. I had no best friend, although Joy LeBlanc, who lived on the first floor of my three-decker, often went with me to the Plymouth on Saturday afternoons. He kept up a steady commentary during the movie, like a radio announcer describing the action. He didn't like to read, and I loved roaming the stacks of Monument Public Library, where I discovered Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald and Jack London, and rushed home with an armful of books. Um, now, so again, what is a hero? Key question posed throughout this book. And there we've met Larry LaSalle. Let's just have a little think about the, the signals and images we get of him straight away. First thing we find out about him. Tall, slim man stepped into view, a lock of blonde hair tumbling over his forehead. Now, this is not so true at the moment, but the traditional portrayal of Superman, you know, the, the hero, 
is that he has they're called a co kiss curl. It's called a little curl of hair on his forehead, and they they used to do that with Superman. They don't anymore. So it immediately this sort of message like he's a superhero, and then the next thing it says his smile revealing dazzling movie star teeth. So this guy looks like a superhero. He looks like a movie star, and then. The description of him makes him sound like he's firstly a hell of a physical specimen, and secondly, he can do anything. He's got the broad shoulders of an athlete and the narrow hips of a dancer. He was both, and it describes how brilliant he is at sports, how brilliant he is at dancing. Um, most of all, though, he's a teacher, the greatest of all superpowers. Um, and he, he teaches all the kids, he does all these things, leading classes and dancing, arts and crafts, organising a choral group, directing musical shows. This bloke sounds amazing. Okay, so our first impression of him, he's incredible. So what's the question that comes into our head? Why does Francis want to kill him? All right, let's get back. So he's talking about how he's sort of quite a solitary kid, but the rec centre gives him a place to hang around. Home was the tenement where I lived with my Uncle Louis, my father's brother, a silent giant of a man who was a yardman at the Monument Comb Shop. He took me in after my father died, cooked our meals and cleaned the apartment. He drank three bottles of beer every night while listening to the radio, volume turned low, until his bedtime at 11 o'clock. He seldom spoke, but I never doubted his affection. He patted me on the head, passing by as I read my books at the kitchen table, and listened solemnly as I told him of my day at school, a duty he required every night at supper. You're a good boy, Francis, he'd tell me as he handed over my 50 cent allowance every Friday night. The loneliness of the tenements drove me to the rec centre after school and on weekends. Without talent for singing or dancing or arts and crafts, I finally joined calisthenics after Larry LaSalle made a speech urging everyone to participate in at least one activity. That's like, um, like, a, like, a, like a Joe Wick keep fit class, basically. I picked a spot in the back row to avoid calling attention to myself. And Lyle LaSalle didn't embarrass me by calling me to the front row where the shorter kids belonged. That implies, doesn't it, a level of understanding and sympathy in Larry LaSalle. He can see that kid's not where he should be, but it's because he's embarrassed. So I will, I will allow him to break the rules because that's where he feels comfortable and able to participate. Larry LaSalle was everywhere in the centre, showing how strips of leather could be made into keychains, old wine jugs into lamps, lumps of clay into ashtrays. He turned a notorious school bully, Butch Bartono, convincing him that he could sing, coaching him patiently day after day, until Butch's version of The Dying Cowboy brought tears to the eyes of everyone in the rec centre's first musical production, Autumn Leaves. But he still beats up kids in the schoolyard, Joy LeBlanc observed. Under Lyre de Salle's guidance, Edna Bouchon, tall and gawky and shy, became the hit of the show, dressed like a bum and dancing an intricate routine with ash cans, winning applause like a Broadway star. You're all stars, Lyre de Salle always told us. Can I just say, right, firstly, this girl is doing a dance routine, dressed like a bum. I just want to point out that's American slang for, like, a, a homeless person. She is not dressed like an actual backside. Please remove that image from your mind, and ash cans, of course, are, um, uh, well, a rubber bin, basically. So, like, the, the old metal bins, you've ever seen those, and the, they'd have the, the lid, and she's, like, doing a dance with the lids. Um, Larry sounds amazing. He gets to school bully and tames him, gets him to sing on stage. He gets the shyest kid in school and makes her the star of the show. It's remarkable. And then you're all stars. This guy sounds perfect. He's considerate about Francis's shyness. So why does Francis want to kill him? Rumours told us that Larry LaSalle had also been a star, performing in nightclubs in New York and Chicago. Someone brought in a faded newspaper clipping, showing him in a tuxedo, standing beside a nightclub placard that read, Starring Larry LaSalle. We knew little about him, however. He discouraged questions. We knew he was born in Frenchtown. Sorry, I lost that there. Oh, what did that? <laughs> Sorry. And his family had left to seek their fortunes elsewhere. Larry had taken dance lessons at Madame Toussaint's studio downtown as a boy and had won first prize in an amateur contest at Monument City Hall when he was nine or ten. Why did he turn his back on show business and return to Frenchtown? No one dared to ask him, although there were dark hints that he'd 
gotten into trouble in New York City. A rumour joined LeBlanc, delighted in repeating with raised eyebrows and a knowing look. Dazzled by his talent and his energy, most of us didn't dwell on the rumours. In fact, the air of mystery that surrounded him added to his glamour. He was our champion, and we were happy to be in his presence. Nicole Renard began coming to the centre that first winter and joined the dancing group. She'd taken lessons in Albany and instantly caught the attention of Larry LaSalle. I'd watch her glide across the floor, catching flashes of her white thighs as she twisted and turned. She seemed to exist in a world of her own, like a rare specimen, bird-like and graceful as she danced, separate from the, other dan the rest of the dancers. She didn't join any of the classes or do exercises or crafts and would simply leave when the dance classes were over. One day, as she headed for the exit, drops of perspiration on her forehead like raindrops on white porcelain, she said, Hello, Francis. That same strange teasing in her voice that I'd heard when she'd warned me about falling off the banister. I gulped, coughed, managed to utter, Hello, but was unable to bring her name to my lips. She paused as if to say more, our eyes meeting in the same connection I'd felt in Sister Matilde's classroom. A moment later she was gone, leaving behind a sweet fragrance mixed with the musky smell of her perspiration and the afterimage of her body leaping through the air. She didn't remind me of Santa Therese anymore, but of the girls in certain magazines at Laurier's drugstore who set my heart racing and made my knees liquid. Nicole's visits to the rec centre made my life there complete. That's why Joey LeBlanc angered me when he said he could feel that old doom all hanging over the place. You talk too much, I said, slamming the door behind me as we'd left the centre one afternoon. Doom, he pronounced. Wait and see. Shivering now as the rain begins to fall, I turn away from the rec centre. Don't know poor Joey LeBlanc, who died on a beach on Iwo Jima in the South Pacific, had been right after all. Just that last chunk there gives us an awful lot to think about. Nicole starts coming to the rec centre. He describes it differently now, doesn't he? He says he doesn't remind her of Santa Rosa anymore. He starts off with this idealised image of her as a perfect, pure saint. Now he's seeing her more like a woman. They're both growing up and he's starting to see her in a more sexual way, isn't he? The glimpses of white thigh perspiration um, the sweet fragrance that she leaves behind she reminds him of certain girls in certain magazines so he looks at women and thinks oh she's nice he's starting to grow up and see her in that way and then there's Joey LeBlanc who predicts that this is a bad place which Francis doesn't like because to him it's a fantastic place he gets to spend some time there not feel lonely and he gets to see Nicole. He doesn't like that. But then that last sentence, which is really chilling, isn't it? Firstly, he says, Joy was right all along. This is a place where bad things will happen. And secondly, that horrible bit, which again, the horrors of war. Joy LeBlanc, again, not a character you'd be asked questions on. But in the context of the horrors of war, maybe. He's portrayed all the way through as this amusing, dorky lad. We've all got one in school, haven't we? Yeah? Every class has a, a sort of character like him. He's ha totally harmless. He's a bit daft. He's a bit too loud for his own good. <laughs> Gets told off by the teachers and he's not really doing much wrong. He just, he's just got a big mouth on him, bless him, and doesn't know when to close it. And he's that sort of lovable character. Um, and all the way through, he's, you know, saying dokey things, embarrassing Francis. And he's just a sweet, lovable child. I mean, he's only a 12 year old and it's really cute and seeing him as this daft character, you know. And then it says, poor Joy LeBlanc who died on a beach in a Wajiwa in the South Pacific. So just in a little throwaway sentence, again, the horrors of war, in just a throwaway sentence, oh, uh, that lovely fun kid dies before he gets to his 20s. It's horrible. So the horrors of war again being emphasised and poor, harmless, cute, fun, youthful Joey never gets to have an adult life. Iwo Jima is one of the major battles in the Second World War where the Americans turn the tide against the Japanese and there's a very famous monument to it in Washington uh, because there was a very famous photograph taken when they took Iwo Jima of American soldiers 
pushing up a flagpole with the American flag on the top, and all master grounds at the bottom of it, pushing it up. And this, this famous picture has been turned into a big statue as a war memorial in the heart of Washington. So um, I'm finishing off some context videos for this to, to give a bit of context to the book. Because you could ask questions at GCSE, but I think that's probably me done now. I'll do the usual trick. If anybody wants to, to get in touch now, go for it. And I will leave the comments. Uh, they're scoring for 10 minutes or so, so I can have a look at comments after. Remember uh, what I said? Have a quick look at the comments from yesterday's and Sophie's point about Canada, the, the, the heavenly place. And I'm still struggling to work out the connection between Canada and the con concentration camps and the reference to Canada here. Similar reference. It's interesting one to sort of try and get your, get your head around if you can work something out or not. So, okay. I'll put it onto the, uh, the post recording thing and I'll see you at the same time tomorrow. Adios, muchachos.